Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Curtain. My name is Carly, and I'm going to be the moderator for today. If you're watching on a desktop computer or on your phone, uh, unfortunately, today's broadcast is not able to be posted live, but next coming Sunday, we're going to be doing a production of Aladdin, and you'll be able to send in your live comments to Ben. But for today's broadcast, you can send any feedback and comments you have to info at majestictheater.com. And if programming like this is something that you value, please consider making a donation at our website. But for right now, I would love to introduce the cast of The Little Princess. Okay, hello and welcome. Uh, whenever you are watching this, welcome and thanks for joining us uh, for another Majestic Children's Theater Behind the Curtain. I'm talking today with the cast of 2016's A Little Princess sometimes known as The Little Princess, but I went with the original title, A Little Princess. I mean, we can get into that <clears throat> later on. So let's go around the room as we normally do, as if it were a first rehearsal meet and greet and you could say your name, who you played in the show and what you're up to these days, briefly. And I will go, as I see it here, with starting with Rocco. Hi there, my name is Rocco Degree. In the show, I play the recurring character Boldeo, also known as Ramdas. Right now, during the pandemic, I'm focusing on original music and cartoon animation, and I just finished my first animated video called It Takes Each Other. <clears throat> Great. Uh, Kaylee? Hi, my name is Kaylee Flanagan, and I played uh, Miss Minchin, so I uh, showed up as Melchizedek the Rat with my uh, puppet friend, Gus. <laughs> um, so I just finished my junior year at Nazareth College studying musical theater. I'm currently doing some uh, music ministry work um, remotely and um, some other cool performance stuff. Um, just joined a voiceover club at school and um, doing some virtual Shakespeare, which is really exciting. Um, so yeah, trying to stay busy and happy <laughs> yeah great thanks thanks Kaylee. uh molly robinson hi i'm molly robinson i played the role of becky in a little princess i just graduated from uh, high school and i will be attending college for theater in the fall and during the pandemic i'm focusing on basically preparing for any auditions for after i, gr I graduate well, I mean, as the, after the pandemic ends, I don't know what to <laughs> So, um, and I'm also doing some writing and drawing. Great. Thanks, Molly. Uh, Molly uh, McLeod. Hi, uh, my name is Molly McLeod, or Molly Damon Rush as I appeared in A Little Princess. I played Lavinia, and now I am out in Arizona quarantining. Uh, I'm still doing theater. I was supposed to be in nine to five on the Majestic stage, which has been pushed back, unfortunately, due to everything that's going on. But right now I'm taking this time to really focus on my art as well as um, tattoo design. Great. Thanks, Molly. Giuseppe? Uh, I'm Giuseppe Santanello. I played Captain Crew and um, I'm not really up to much. I just got into a new hobby, um, doing stocks. <laughs> That's about it. Yeah. The stock market, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. That's great. Uh, Maddie. Hi, I'm Maddie Hartling. I played Ermengarde and then uh, one of the maids in the beginning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my starring role. <clears throat> and I just finished my freshman year at the University of Rhode Island, where I'm in the doctor of pharmacy program, and I minor in biology and Spanish. Uh, right now, I'm just, you know, living through a pandemic, chilling, uh, looking for a job because I worked at a Dunkin' at school, but I can't live in Rhode Island anymore because mm. there's a pandemic going on. But it's been chill. It's been Great. <laughs> Thanks, Maddie. I see Natalie. Um, hi, I'm Natalie Pettit. I played Lottie in A Little Princess. I'm going in sixth grade, and I still do um, plays and musicals at school. Great. Thanks, Natalie. And I see Olivia. Hey, guys. I'm Olivia Taylor. 
Um, I play Sarah Crew, the little princess. Um, I currently live in Punta Gorda, Florida, where I just finished my junior year at Charlotte High School. I'm the president of my theater club, and I sing, and I just do all the stuff that, you know, it's fun to do. <laughs> great. So you're still involved in theater? Yeah. That's great. When you had, um, you had moved not too long after we did Little Princess to Florida, I remember, yeah. you know, moving is, can be tough for any, at any age, and I remember you weren't too crazy about it. That was several years ago now. Have you uh, adjusted? How, how is life there now? Um, honestly, when I first moved there, I was terrified. I was a freshman. Um, yeah, that's tough. I was, I was going to a new school. My school was huge. It was terrifying. But I've just kind of cornered the market on like the things that I like and the things I do. I have pretty good friends and, you know, I maybe I won't probably won't do theater forever, but, you know, I love it now. And, you know, it's what we can do and is do the things we love. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I remember, too, Olivia, at the time when you were uh, moving and, and dealing with those feelings that my I remembered writing the very last couple pages of Little Princess at my parents' uh, old house that they lived in from from 1992 to uh, to 2016. So the house that I grew up in, and I couldn't help the move at the time. So I just watched uh, I think Natalie and some of the kids uh, in the pool out back while I finished writing. So it was literally people moving stuff out of the house you know, around me, very similar to Captain Crew and, and Sarah at the very beginning of, you know, of people moving and not wanting to move. And so anyway, it's just kind of a funny uh, connection. And it was sad even for me, you know, at my age. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, every time I do this, I just kind of throw it out to you guys. We we did get together for a discussion the other day and we had a nice discussion. And I think we'll, we'll naturally uh, fall upon some of the things we talked about again and more. Uh, but I will just throw it out to you guys for any question at all or comment, whether it's about the story itself, the original novel, or the Shirley Temple adaptation, or the 1995 movie, which is a good movie, I think, and uh, or any other one, um, uh, and, and contrast and contra compared to our adaptation of it, or about the production elements itself, the acting, the costumes, the lights, sets, props, anything like that. So I'll throw it open to you guys, anybody at all. Go ahead, don't be shy. I think uh, a nice place to start uh, would be to talk about uh, character development. Sarah Crew is able to change so many uh, characters in this play, especially Miss Minchin and of course her friends. Um, let's, let's talk about that. I think a good place to start would be um, how Miss Minchin changes as a character. Sure, sure yeah, the influence that Sarah has on uh, all, all those around her is a, is a huge part of the play. Um, I'll, I'll throw that to, to Kaylee in that case and ask about you, what was it like to play, uh, we were joking about this yesterday, that you're like the sweetest person in real life, but you, have, you played a, you know, an evil old witch here. But what's, <laughs> but what's her deal, you know? Why is she that way? And or what, what did you make of all that when putting, putting it together? I mean, I, I'm trying to remember kind of like, my process in, in figuring out who she was. And I can't remember exactly what I decided on as her backstory. Um, but I think a lot of it comes down to a jealousy, um, you know, and, and not just in regards to Sarah's wealth and like, you know, the, the external things, but um, the fact that she has a father who loves her so much and, um, you know, she knows who she is and, and she feels, um, there's a, there's a confidence which is so striking, you know, at such a young age, and also a, a kindness and a wisdom and an intelligence. You know, you see that even um, in the moment where Miss um, Minchin is uh, like talking about the French and, and 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 telling Sarah that maybe she should learn French because she has a French maid, and um, then we we learn that Miss Minchin herself doesn't know French. So there's kind of like this feeling of inferiority. There's kind of a sense of of feeling threatened. Um, um, and I think it's because she probably never experienced that same kind of love or that same kind of joy or confidence that Sarah has. Um, and whereas maybe those exact things are what um, 
bring out the best in Sarah's friends. They and, and ultimately in Miss Minchin, they kind of first draw out the worst in her yeah. because she doesn't know how to how to cope with that. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, absolutely. I remember Kaylee, I don't know if you remember this at one point, a couple performances in, uh, I had noticed I was just observing as I do occasionally the kids uh, afterwards getting their autograph uh, from you guys and saying hello, uh, which is great. Uh, but I remember a lot of the kids asking you, why is she so mean mm -hmm. to Sarah? I remember you kind of going, oh, I'm not, you know, not, not too sure. I remember asking you about, you know, consider, and I almost like wrote this into the play, consider like what, yeah, at the end, Sarah is, is reunited with, with two things, and that's wealth, mm -hmm. and all that entails, the comfort of wealth, and a loving father, you know? And it's like, if you were to, if you were to think, um, did Miss Minchin grow up rich or poor? Right. Well, Probably. What would you guess, you know? Probably not rich. Poor, yeah. Probably yeah. poor. And then, and then, yeah, if you were to guess if she had a loving father or not a loving father, the answer probably seems not. obvious. Yeah. yeah, probably not. And there's a nice moment in the 95 movie where, even though I don't think this matches Sarah's character, she says something like, you know, all girls are princesses. Didn't your father ever ever say that to you? Um, and the, the look on, on the actress's face is mm. kind of says it all, you know? Um, yeah, and then there's the sense of uh, one of my favorite lines in Sleeping Beauty is when the fairies are talking about Maleficent. Um, and they say, and one of them says, you know, I don't think she's very happy. You know, so there's a truth in, yeah. in any sort of villain to look to that they're not happy, you know? Yeah, which is interesting. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Maddie? I think also, um, it's funny to see how Miss Minchin took that route of not having a loving father. And then Ermengarde also mm. it shows that she doesn't have that. And instead of becoming mean, she kind of closes off a bit and becomes very to herself um, and very shy. And I'm wondering, you know, had Sarah not been around, would she have grown to be the bitter person that Miss Minchin is? And yeah. if Miss Minchin had had someone like Sarah to intervene in her youth and, you know, show her that love, you know, what love is and what that kind of relationship entails if she would have, you know, gone about a, bit, a different path. Yeah, yeah, I love that it's mentioned that, you know, Bermengard talks about her father and that he's like, well, he's he's a little cold. I don't see him much. He's always working. Mm -hmm. He's appointed with me in school and. Yeah. Yeah, and that's interesting. And that's ultimately just kind of a setup for the payoff of Miss Mitchell mm -hmm. saying uh, in the attic scene, yeah. just think how disappointed your father will be. And it's like, oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's just devastating to hear in the audience. Oh, that's right. She, she has a, a complex relationship with her father. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a anybody else? Yeah, Molly. Uh, 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 Robert. I feel like also in a way, um, Sarah also helps Becky quite a bit because Becky virtually, I didn't even think about this until we all, until um, Kaylee and Maddie start talking about their characters, but Becky starts the musical with absolutely no one really. Miss Minton treats her horribly, doesn't allow her to talk to the other girls. And it's hinted that with, with the chef and her, the chef also doesn't treat her very well either. And Sarah is really the first person to ever really treat her with kindness. And Becky goes from being this very, nervous shy doesn't know how to really and doesn't and only really knows how to do what everyone else tells her to do and doesn't know really what kindness is and she opens up a bit more and she becomes and you can tell that from the very beginning of the play when she's just she how even just meeting sarah for the first time really makes her happier and changes the way she thinks about life in a way and that i just i didn't notice about this until i actually started thinking about other plays in which one characters changes the life of everyone else and it makes them so much happier and it really just shows in how one person can change someone's life forever yeah yeah and there's this there's this kind of class thing that you know is now a, you know an outdated thing that was going on at the time there and um yeah i love how sarah just sees sees the girls equally there's kind of a prince and a pauper thing going on with her and becky um in the sense you know she says several times early on we're just two little girls 
only two little girls and it's an accident that I, that you weren't, you know, I was born where I was born and you were born where you were born. And, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful little relationship. And the idea, I love Boldeo's line about, uh, after, after Sarah and Becky meet for the first time and she gives her cake and f tells her stories or whatever. And, oh, and, and lets her sit by the fire. Um, and Boldeo says something like, uh, she was not, when she left, she wasn't the same Becky who, who went, who, uh, met, you know, went to meet Sarah and she was fed and warmed, but not just by the cake and fire, but by, by Sarah herself, by like a friendship, you know, and being treated, uh, equally, you know, yeah. any, anybody else? Yeah. Um, I was, yeah. I wanted to talk about, um, distribute distributing um the wealth like distributing like she didn't give her wealth of like, her possessions but like she gave yeah. her personality like she gave everything about her and she didn't realize it I don't even think I realized it when I was performing but she just changed lives yeah yeah and you bring up a good point that her her her, her her true wealth is just what what she's like you know that and that's why uh it, it doesn't when she loses everything it doesn't make it doesn't matter you know and she's able to stay the same person and in that way uh win against miss minchin you know uh because you can't you can't confiscate your brain you know and, and your personality <clears throat> you know you can't lock those you can lock up the person but you can't get rid of those things you know um yeah, yeah, that's a nice, that's a nice point there, Olivia. Uh, anybody else, guys, on that same kind of theme? Yeah, Kaylee? Uh, uh, you could probably speak to this better, Olivia, but I was just, I was thinking, and, and feel free to chime in, like, Sarah, you know, talking about character development, like, she, we could say that she doesn't really develop, she stays the same, but at the same time, like, her, her circumstances change so drastically that she has to kind of change with them. And the choice isn't to become like a completely different person, but to solidify who she is and, and to like own more truly um, and give more truly that wealth and that joy and that love that exists in her. I don't know if that made sense. <laughs> like it's like her, her circumstances change and they, we could say they don't change her, but I think in some ways they, they challenge her to become even more so who she always was, to become yeah. so who she's meant to be. Yeah, it's a challenge for her. She, she, does, she does change, certainly, um, Haley. Um, yeah, so she has a character development, too, and that's that she, yeah, like Lavinia says, it's all well and good to pretend and, and, and make up stories and, and, be, and act like a princess if you're, you're well off and you have everything. But could you still have that character if you were poor and had nothing? Um, and you see Sarah s struggle with it. Um, and there's a sense that isn't really in our play. It's definitely in the Shirley Temple one where, and I think in the novel where, yeah, she's overworked and underfed and stuff, but there's a, a certain sense of, that we didn't really address in the play where doing the work actually improves her and it like it's good for her. And I can just remember Shirley Temple in the movie like, you know, she is with her gumption and rolling up her sleeves and well, I'm going to do these dishes, you know, um, you know, that I think is good, is good for a kid, you know? Um, yeah. And speaking of just influencing, uh, people, it became very clear early on when, when adapting the play that the scene structure of act one, it just seemed obvious. Like once you set up the main, the main stuff that the next scene, scene by scene was just, Here's how Sarah influenced this person. Here's how Sarah influenced this person, and then so in that sense, it was easy to come up with a with a structure. And similarly to like the Jungle Book, where it's Mowgli coming to the jungle in Act One, and then the second act, it's the jungle coming to him. In this play, it's similar structure-wise in the sense that Act One, it's Sarah coming to the school and the effect that she has on everybody, and then Act Two is everybody coming to. I mean, Sarah, the people that she has influenced now come to her to yeah. help her out uh, in her in her time of need. You know what I mean? So that's uh, that's a nice thing. And then certainly by the end, that very last uh, scene, seeing the influence that she has on everybody is 
crystal clear from Miss Minchin walking in with the kind of the, the teary eyed smile on her face, observing the girls to um, a beautiful, if I may say, set up and pay off with Ermengarde that Sarah mm -hmm. teaches her how to read. And then the very last thing is her reading a letter and reading it well aloud to Lavinia, encouraging Ermengarde, you know, see, and, and hanging out with the girls. It seems like they're all friends now and that she's taken the, the lead of, of uh, going in for Sarah. You know, uh, yeah, uh, Molly Robinson. Yeah, I also want to just, I was thinking about this and I just realized something. I think in a way, Sarah helped bring the girls together as a group of friends because yeah. if you've seen the early scenes of act one, they're all, even the school scene, they're all like separated by their desks. Yes. And Miss Minchin <laughs> also never really is big on, on this. Cause every time we see Miss Minchin, she's always like, girls go to your rooms. And the, she's not really big on keeping them on help on keeping them all to get on um, encouraging them to be friends. And it's, Sarah, who that winds up bringing them all together to become friends, sort of like that one person that befriends everybody and then brings them all together, and they start and they all become friends. Yeah, and you're right on the money, Molly. With uh, yeah, that's intentional that the desks are separated out and they're they're not even looking at each other, you know, at the beginning, so they don't even really seem to have a, a, a friendship right at all, you know. Um, yeah, Maddie. On that, I the one scene with Urban Guard and Sarah after the reading where they go to her room. I mean, Irvingard even gives all these excuses to why she's not friends with the other girls. You know, Lottie's so young, Lavinia's mean, we're not supposed to talk to Becky. Like, it's almost like there's rules set up that are put in place, you know, societally that means that she can't be friends with any other girls. Yeah, yeah. And what's the lighting like, uh, incidentally, in the schoolroom scene? It's very, like, more grim-ish, kind of darker. Yeah, it's dark, um, it's and, dark kind of, and old. Old, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it gets and it gets warmer uh, in the scenes with with Sarah and the girls. Yeah. Yeah, so that's no accident. And Molly McLeod, were you going to say something a moment ago? I thought I saw a hand going up. It's if not, that's okay. Unmute yourself, dear. Okay, geez. There you go. Yes, I wasn't trying to say anything. Oh, sure. But I'm just shifting around a lot. <laughs> okay, no problem. Rocco, you had your, your hand up. I think talking about the lights would be a really good transition to talk about the production of the show. Mm -hmm. I was really Great. inspired by um, the use of sound effects uh, and backward sound effects, uh, the voiceovers, especially in that schoolroom scene. Can you talk about like what inspired you to put that in the play or um, what message you were trying to like uh, convey there? Well, the, well, first let me say with the sound effects, I don't one of the disappointing things with the, you know, there's almost nothing disappointing about the recording, but uh, is that I don't recall the, like the clock chime and some of those others being so overpowering. Maybe they were and I fixed it later. Um, but that's a good reason to watch these videos with the subtitles if you guys haven't. Um, so anyway, I don't remember if the sound effects were like, were, were like that live. But um, I like the, the clock chime being like a kind of a school bell. It sounds... British, you know, it sounds like Big Ben going off. Mm -hmm. um, the little backward sound effect that Rocco's talking about is when uh, in the classroom scene where it says, uh, and from that moment on, uh, Miss Minchin had something of a grudge toward her new star pupil with the whole misunderstanding uh, about French and all that. And, uh, and uh, that previous season, I did sound design work for our, our production of an inspector calls. <clears throat> and I remember the director just asked that uh, when he comes in, it's kind of a twilight zone of a story where, where time, she suggested this idea where time sort of stops. So she asked for like clock gears and uh, ticking and then going into a, a loud clock chime. So I just looked up um, or I might've taken a clock chiming backwards and put it in some program that uh, makes it backwards for you and thought it sounded really cool. And I just wanted to use that here. It, it just seemed to work. Um, and then I ended up using the, the very same kind of backward chiming when we did through the looking glass. Uh, Molly mm. Robinson. So it was a good opportunity to bring that back. I think it all feels very British, like something about a mm. clock. Maybe it's Big Ben, like, <laughs> but it's just like a clock feels British. 
<laughs> feels Victorian. It puts you in that time and place. Yeah. Big time. Um, what about, uh, let's, is there any other sound effects or music, Rocco? You want to mention? I'm blanking. Maddie, go ahead. There was just one moment. I'm not sure if it was intentional, but it's when Captain Crew drops Sarah off um, at the school, and Miss Minton says, "Well, I'm not. Sh I'm sure she won't find any trouble here." And then you hear this ominous clock chime. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was really cool. <laughs> I thought it was like, oh no, she's gonna find a lot of trouble. She's gonna find trouble. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's gonna so much trouble. Yeah, and everyone knows that when you're watching the play. Yeah. I mean, you know she's about to run into trouble, mm -hmm. and I love his line about. If she lived a few centuries ago, she would have been going about the country with her sword drawn, rescuing and defending everyone who was in distress. You know, mm -hmm. so that's just setting up what you're gonna what you're gonna see. Mm -hmm. um, any other sound or, or music things? Uh... Well, we could talk about Giuseppe and his playing. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so um, just go ahead, Giuseppe. If you got something to say about it. Yeah. So in the beginning, when I played, um, Steve gave me the music. I was taking piano lessons at the time and he gave me the sheets for the music and I brought them to my piano teacher. And I think it wasn't that it was too complicated. It okay. was more that there wasn't enough time because I think my lessons were running out. Like because okay. during the summer I didn't do lessons. So there was like a, a date where I ended. So I didn't have enough. She didn't feel like we had enough time to do it. I think I had one or two lessons left. So Steve took it and he was like, all right, I got this. So he learned it and then he taught me and then I learned it really fast and then uh, I ended up playing it and I now I don't know how to play it but I wish I, could. <laughs> I really wish I I kept that. <laughs> yeah, that's a nice that's a nice piece of music and um uh yeah, I knew that Giuseppe was going to play the character I think before we wrote it. So I wrote into the story that her father is a pianist. Mm -hmm. That's not in the novel. But it seemed to make sense to me. A pianist wouldn't make a lot of money, so he'd be interested in, in making money with the diamond mines. And I, uh, I thought it'd just be great to, to see uh, someone playing live. Um, and it is awesome in that first scene when he plays and the music seems to match what's going on. And it also sets up that the music, the rest of the piano music that we hear, speaking of sound effects and music, comes from some real place. It's not just, uh, it's not just out there. There's a, like a justification for it in the story, even up until the very end when uh, Maddie's reading the letter and, and, and Sarah says, my father's learning all his old songs on the piano again. If you op if I, we opened a window, you could probably hear it from the attic. And then the, the very last music that we hear is piano. So it could be coming, it, that could be coming from the attic. And I remember at the time when blocking it, I, I did, you know, it's beautiful that we have Baldeo on one side of this, on stage right, and a rat popping out, although I think he, he missed his entrance in that recording. Doesn't matter, because he's off the camera anyway. Um, so you see everybody she influenced, including the rat, uh, on one side. And then on the other, I was hoping to have the piano there. And as Maddie was reading the letter, that Captain Crew would come out, now walking, so we see him out of the wheelchair. Mm -hmm and sit at the piano and start playing and Sarah would come over and, and sit beside him, you know, maybe lean her head on, on him or something. And I, I was thinking maybe Giuseppe could play that song live too. But the, the hard logistics of the Majestic, right? And our parameters are tough. And it was gonna be awfully clunky to try and get a piano out there for the very last scene. And, you know, you need to balance out something like that with just keeping the play moving. So I scratched it. But, yeah. Anybody else? Rocco? Uh, you teaching Giuseppe the piano part kind of reminds me of this uh, consistent thing that happens in uh, Majestic Children's Theater. Uh, that same thing happened in, in Charlie Brown uh, yeah. with uh, uh, Felix. Uh, Felix was like, um, didn't really know like that much piano, but then just like, learned it in like two days for the course of the, um, like for the show. And then the same thing like with Poncha the Parrot. It's like, oh, you've never worked with animals on stage? Great, let's change that. You never worked with puppets? Great, now you can work with puppets. Not, not the best dancer, now we're all dancing. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> yeah, so that's really, that's a really great, um, it's really great that like, you kind of like push us out of our like comfort mm -hmm. zones for the sake of these shows. It's great. Always yeah, great. and I push myself out of it too. <laughs> to the point where, I, <laughs> what am I doing? 
it, speaking of that, that's a, a good example of that also with the play, uh, aside from Giuseppe's piano playing, is Olivia learning that, that piece of French. Mm. Mm. I love that scene. That, you, that pours Great out. Scene. Of you. <laughs> well. How did we accomplish that, Olivia? Oh my gosh. Um, I actually, well, I took this uh, tip from Rocco in his Boldeo speech in Jungle Book. He played his recording overnight while he slept. I remember this. <laughs> and so I did that. I would, I had my earbuds in and I would go to sleep and I would listen to it, my re own recording. And, um, um, I was French, I'm French Canadian. So my, gr I would like say it to my grandma and she didn't really understand it. Cause like she hasn't spoken French since she was like a little kid, but <laughs> that doesn't matter. <laughs> and it was just really cool. Cause it was like, I hadn't really, I'm not really a big linguistic person, but like being able to speak that and just like accomplish that. Like I, when Stephen handed that to me, I thought I was never going to be able to, I was like, Stephen, what? And you just like, you just like believed in me and like, I can't believe I did it. <laughs> of course. Yeah. And I, I got um, a good friend of the theater and a, and a frequent actor here, Stuart Gamble, who teaches uh, high school French and Spanish. And he was kind enough to come in and, and sit down with you for like an hour and just go over the pronunciation. And he also f helped fix my, you know, Google Translate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Stuart was yeah, awesome. You know? He just, um, he like gave me like confidence because we would sound through words that like I didn't know and like I wasn't familiar with. And I was, I, he like wrote out the phonetics of it mm -hmm. and like, the phonetic yeah. alphabet was really helpful to me. And it, it was just on my side the whole time. So. Yeah. And after all, you only have to, it's not, you don't have to learn the whole French language, you know? Yeah, of course. Like whenever I had to do like an accent before, I'd say to myself, take it easy. You only have to know these lines. In the <laughs> <other> part, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, of course, uh, and Stuart had said, uh, I was like, how's she doing? And he was like, wow, she's, how old are you, Olivia? Um, I'm 17 now, but I believe back then I was like 12. <laughs> yeah, like 12 or 13. He was like, well, she's, she's, she's 13. She's a sponge, you know, she's picking it up easy, you know? So yeah, it's a great, uh, doing theater is a great way to just kind of learn other things and you never know what, what the heck that's going to be sometime. Yeah, definitely. Um, oh, Rocco brought up before the sound effects, the voiceovers, mm -hmm. uh, which I really like. And the first one really is just to set up the second one, uh, you know, I love the one where their uh, Miss Minchin is, is looking at her. And then again, we hear the, the piano mu music. And I love that Justin was good enough to zoom in on that moment and uh, what she thinks in her mind. And, you know, you are a you're a poor, vulgar old thing. And <laughs> I think that's great. And then but then she stands up and says, Merry Christmas, you know, uh, but Miss Minchin knows there's something going on in the mind. Uh, I thought of this movie with re regarding Little Princess, and I'm not a, the biggest fan of this movie. It gets overplayed. I don't know why. It's a perfectly good movie, but uh, The Shawshank Redemption, if you guys know that movie. I mean, the effect that Andy Dufresne has on all the prisoners. It's about someone who's in a prison system unjustly, and he just has this positive effect on everybody around him in the prison. And the head, the head jailer, is is a Miss Minchin like guy. He's someone who is who is corrupt and unjust. <clears throat> and Andy kind of stands up to him and outsmarts him. Uh, yeah. Anyway, any anybody else on anything at all? Um, I really like the moment where Baldeo and Sarah Crew first meet in the street, but they don't recognize each other and they just pass by that's also staged really well and of course with the lights dim and the sound of the snowstorm it's really uh um i i don't know you get you get into this you really get into the, the play there um like the world of the play um let's uh let's let's talk about that moment uh Boldeo has this really uh great line it's like if if i only knew like i could have um like i could have saved him mm. Yeah, yeah, I like that moment a lot. I mean, in the in the novel, of course, people don't know this. The father does indeed die, and uh, it's like his friend who seeks out Sarah. He just have he knows he's he's got a daughter somewhere, and he kind of becomes this adopted father. 
for her. But the Shirley Temple movie changes it to that he's got amnesia, and so does the 95 movie. Um, so I wanted to stick to that. I, that's what most people know and expect, and it would be a little too bleak if he was he died. Um, so yeah, I like I like that moment too, Rocco. And speaking of sound effects, I like the the brass quartet in the street playing Christmas music. Mm -hmm. And I think there's like a horse clopping uh, as well. So it's just a way to put us out into the street because this is the cast right here. I, I can't have a bunch of extras walking around down the street and there's a carpet still sitting there that I'm not going to take the time to get rid of. It would be nice to see snow and vendors or whoever else, but you, know, you can't do it. So make up for it with some nice lighting and, and some sound effects and it kind of puts you in that world. And there's a certain minimalist uh, charm uh do that as well and i love uh, in that moment that he brings up mowgli and and so there's we're not ham hammering it over people's heads but just to bring that up and say there's something about her the look in their, her eyes you know there's uh, it spoke of a fierce bravery on one hand and on the other hand of a, a gentleness and kindness uh and i would i would see that again in another child uh mowgli um so Anybody else on any other uh, moment of the play? Yeah. I thought we're just bringing up scenes and, and talking about them. I mean, if you want to go about it that way. Olivia, are you going to say something? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, like, when I, when I, like, realized I was playing Sarah Crew, because I actually had told Stephen, like, I talked to him, and I was like, I, like, just finished this book. Like, I can't believe you're doing that. I just finished this book. And um, it was, like, the original book. And I, she was like, so, she was like an icon. Yeah. She, she, like she, she shocked the cultures and I was so inspired by her and like, just yeah. talking about, like her character and like being able to like transform yourself and just stand resilient, like a, like a soldier. Um, yeah. Just like, wow. Like what a strong, strong, strong character. Yeah, she is a hell of a character, and oh and uh, and I it's... wish that she was more iconic in pop culture. You know, yeah. I don't know why. You know, I wish a little princess was a was a better known story. Mm -hmm. Most people know uh, Frances Hodgson Burnett's uh, for Secret Garden. Right. You know, and Mary Lennox, who was who was similar, and there's lots of similarities there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Sarah Cruz is an inspiring character, um, and I felt that too reading it. Olivia, uh, it's a lovely novel. And I have to say, um, this is a typical thing, you know, in, in theater nowadays that I see, and I understand it, and there's perfectly good reasons for it, I suppose. But it's like, there's this thing where it's like, well, if you're gonna do Raisin in the Sun, your director better be African-American. Or if you're gonna do a play that has, a, if you're gonna do like Steel Magnolias, your director ought to be a woman, and maybe, but just consider that a little princess, you know, was written by two dudes, <laughs> you know, in their twenties, and <laughs> you know, so there's no reason that 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 me or you know whoever can't relate to a little girl uh, character just based on her her character traits and her virtues, you know. Mm -hmm. so I don't, you know, there's no reason that uh, I'm sure a lot of families who had maybe just sons were like, ah, I'm not taking my boys to that. That's for girls. You know, and I remember even having that feeling with, I can't remember if I saw the movie as a kid or if I just saw like a trailer for it, like a really long tra trailer for it. But I remember even as a kid being like, ah, it's for girls. Yeah. It's not, it's for everybody. Stories are for everybody, right, Natalie? Yeah. That's yeah. your line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Um, let's let's talk about how, um, uh, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Boldeo and and um uh the Giuse uh, Giuseppe's uh character uh, Mr Mr Crew um when I'm trying to jog uh, his memory while he's in the wheelchair and I'm uh, bandaging up his head that's a really great scene like earlier we had talked about how like that would be a really great like audition monologue just like mm -hmm. describing uh Sarah not knowing that like this is um Mr Crew's uh, daughter and all of a sudden he says like oh I have a daughter and then we have like, this <laughs> yeah. really exciting moment of, of hope um, yeah yeah and speaking of um, jogging his memory 
I think it's fascinating too, because speaking of like music not coming just not coming just from out of the sky for sound effects purposes, and unfortunately it's hard to see on our recording, but in both cases in the beginning of Act Two, when we hear music and when in your scene with Captain Crew, there is that the Victrola, right, the record player there. And in that scene where he just says, Oh, I have a daughter passively. <laughs> but there's almost a justification with the music because the music that's playing on the Victrola is the same song that he was playing at the beginning of the play, the last kind of the last time he was with Sarah, you know? So it's nice that, uh, again, the, the music is not just there. It kind of, kind of plays a part in the story. Natalie, yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, in this um, story and in, even in the play, there's a lot of storytelling. Sarah. Yeah stories and so like why why do you think that is so important in the story like with all the stories she tells how does that influence everybody else yeah well I can throw I can throw it to others but I'll just say briefly thanks Natalie absolutely correct storytelling funny enough is a theme in itself in this uh, story as it is in Jungle Book which gives it gives them a nice connection as it is in Sleepy Hollow so, and I'd say right off the bat, the biggest importance is uh, we still engage in it totally, but just in a different way. There's just a billion TV shows and it's mostly, you know, television and movies and things. Um, but just consider a time when there was no radio, nothing, you know, all you got is, is our, our novels and, uh, and orally telling stories. So, yeah, anyone want to comment on that theme, Kaylee? Well, I think especially, like, it's especially powerful um, in, like, on stage, too, because, I mean, this is the whole reason why we do it, because stories are powerful and they can change lives. So I think that's a really cool thing. And, and it, you know, I, I mean, I wasn't obviously watching the show. I was in it. But I, I would hope that for audiences, too, you know, it... it <sighs> It kind of reminds them why why they come and, and why this is important and why like children should be able to enjoy these things like theater isn't just for the adults like it it, it has such power and gives such hope um, to kids um, and 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 again on another level you know like this is also why it's so important that we do this kind of thing now because stories are kind of all we have to keep us together and we can look back on these things and you know remember look to stories like that of Sarah or that of Mowgli and, and remember that we're not alone so I think that's yeah. a cool thing. Absolutely and I love her perspective uh, in the attic scene where she says we're in a story uh, right. you know I'm a character and you're a character and to have to f have that feeling about you know your sense of life and how you look at the world and and um I think that's a moral and rational way to, to, to look at things that you're the, you're the protagonist in your own, you know, in your own life, and the people around you are characters. And, and even just the fact that uh, this story has that kind of Cinderella connection and the moment when she, one of the stories she's telling is Cinderella and being locked up in the attic. And then that kind of literally happens. And then right. Captain crew coming is almost like the prince with mm -hmm. the slipper and, finding the right girl, you know? Right. Um, so yeah, Molly uh, Robinson. Speaking of that scene in, um, and she's talking, when the storytelling scene in act one where she's singing and she pushed and pulled the door and then yeah. Benia walks in and Ermagard comments and then came the evil stepsister as <laughs> sort of like a, sort of supposed to be like a, um, as a mocking thing. And then in the end, it's actually Lavinia that does save the day in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's basically, where she basically, um, where she is seen as the evil stepsister and she instead winds up coming and rescuing Sarah. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Molly. Uh, uh, McLeod, do you want to talk at all about Lavinia and, and what's going on uh, with her and why does she finally uh, save, save the day? Yeah, so, I mean, I always kind of look at Lavinia as like a Sharpe Evans type character so she she kind of like is probably the most popular the most like best student at the school and then in comes sarah who shows her up in like french and in manners and in all these other things so that probably was 
a big shock for her. And um, I mean, even before Sarah came, apparently she was mean as well. So I don't know if that's part of the way she was raised, if she was just um, raised to look down on other people. But yeah, it's just something that she probably struggles with. For me personally, I wish I played more of that internal struggle throughout the play. Um, Rewatching it, it's more of like, oh, I'm really mean for the whole play. And then I suddenly decide to go let Sarah out of her room. And so I, I wish there was more of that struggle that I could have uh, portrayed physically, but it definitely, it was probably more of a mental struggle in her mind of deciding what path she wants to take. It's funny you say that, Molly, because I, I, when I was rewatching it, I, I thought to myself the same thing, but not of your performance, but of my writing. And I think we might have mentioned this in rehearsal, that I wish I'd put in there, like, perhaps she lost, maybe her father has died. And, like, so that gives some kind of justification more for her saving the day at the end in the sense that... Uh, Miss Minchin keeping her from being reunited with her father is just too evil. And her, her heart couldn't handle that. She's after, she can't be that bad, you know? Yeah. Um, but anyway, it, nevertheless, it's a nice character arc uh, thing that I don't recall being in the book. And in the 95 movie, I remember just Lavin Lavinia at the end, just suddenly burst into tears and hug Sarah and that's kind of it. So I like in our version that, that it comes yeah. down to, <laughs> it comes down to Lavinia that that completes some kind of arc, you know, and gives her a purpose and she changes, um, even mm -hmm. if it's just instantaneously. But yeah, I wish I we'd perhaps given her a little more uh, justification or something. Natalie. What's funny is I, rem I remember rewatching it and uh, she go uh, Lavinia goes from like this, everybody thinks of her as mean and then she gets Sarah out of her room. But I remember hearing her say, oh, shut up, come on. And so she like, she didn't like totally change. She didn't want to like completely <laughs> being like she was before. But it was funny because I, I heard her hearing that and it was funny. Just, like she didn't yeah, totally change. Yeah. yeah, that's a funny line, you know, and because it's like Sarah could have said, "Oh, Lavinia," but I thought, and but you are, blah blah blah, and it's like that's almost me saying, "Shut up." We yeah, we get it. She's helping. She's saving the day. Yeah, Kaylee, you're gonna say something. I, I was gonna say I think the choice that you you made to uh, like keep Lavinia kind of silent in that moment was actually kind of powerful because it kept the audience kind of wondering like what was even happening, you know, and then you were almost made more aware of the fact that there had been an internal struggle um, because, you know, the girls have no idea what's happening. They see Lavinia, they, they think she's about to tell on them, yeah, yeah. you know, and so that's kind of uh, a scary but exciting thing. And um, I mean, maybe there's a moment even where Lavinia thinks she's going to like, you know, rat them out, but yeah, yeah. she doesn't. And so that's kind of a cool, I, I think that makes the, the transformation even more powerful yeah and i think it's a nice device in the scene because it's like where's this all going is lottie right. gonna get a hold of those keys right you know what's gonna happen and i think lavinia stepping forward and and uh and and taking care of it is kind of unexpected so it's a nice it's a nice device to keep the keep the story moving yeah natalie um it also shows how um, Lavinia did like she had in her mind that thought that she wanted to save the day because she could have let Lottie get the keys and gone and got Olivia but she purposefully interrupted and said Miss Minchin so she could grab the keys and take them from her yeah. took them to the library yeah and also and I will say Lottie trying to get the keys and just missing them and Miss Minchin taking a step, et cetera. I totally ripped off from, you know, the, the Disney Cinderella. I can remember that the mice are trying to get the, the keys to the attic out of her pocket. And, uh, you know, her hand just misses them and things like that, which is always fun in a kid's story when they're, 
yeah, right there, you know, that suspense. Yeah, Rocco. Uh, with that suspense, it's a really nice way to wrap up the play because we have, uh, like, we have, like, Sarah, um, Sarah, uh, Sarah Crew, like, with her friends, like, trying to, trying to save her. And then we have uh, Boldeo and, and Mr. Crew um, try, trying to find her. And then we have, like, the cop, and we have all these characters coming at the end. It's a classic, like, sitcom thing where you have, like, the two stories that come together. Yeah, it all comes really together. Really nice way to wrap up the play. It's very action packed and suspenseful. Yeah, and I like the cop coming in, which is more the device used in um, the Shirley Temple movie and the 95 movie, this idea of the police coming. It just adds a nice kind of ticking clock and more makes it a little more suspenseful. Mm. And it also does a nice thing where, you know, in Sarah's voiceover early on in Act 2, when she's saying to herself, um, to Miss Minchin in her mind, that I am a princess and if I chose you, I could wave my hand and my servants would come and take you away. And lo and behold, there's a policeman at the end literally saying, just say the word and I'll take her away. So it, kind of, it came true, you know? And then of course, Sarah being like Forrest Gump, just like- Forrest like, Gump. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, the, the, way that, the way that she changes everybody. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then just like has the power to like lock her up and you know like she's done so many like evil things to her and just decides like no and that's that's why um this mention changes at the end yeah i think so too that's uh, that when the cop says to her after she pardons miss mention the cop says to her uh, that's quite the child isn't it you know and i almost wrote wrote in miss mention saying yeah yeah she is you know Finally, just kind of admitting that and accepting it and getting over her uh, jealousy and all that. But it's better it's better even not to say it because you, you can see it in Kaylee's face. Mm -hmm. And we love we were talking about this yesterday about, you know, the qualities that tie uh, Sarah Crew to, to, to Mowgli, um, you know, the child hero, the child protagonist being brave and kind and using their mind, you know, and their mind being their most powerful weapon. And, but another quality shown in that moment is her she has this firm sense of justice you know about what's fair and what's just and i love that she pardons miss minchin but it's conditional she doesn't just uh say oh i forgive you and whatever she goes no she did mistreat me because that's the truth and i think so and sarah's has a commitment to what's true that's a quality of a hero but you know so she says i i wish to pardon her don't take her away as long as she treats the girls here and whoever else comes here and she doesn't say um uh, whoever else comes just treat them well unconditionally she says as long as you treat everyone that comes here as well as they deserve so not just well unconditionally but treat them well such as they deserve so so if someone was was immoral and misbehaving Miss Minchin would still have every right to punish them or whatever um so I like that uh, element that she doesn't just say I forgive you and, and all is forgiven it's yeah it's a conditional and it just shows this power that she has um anything to say Olivia on that moment or that stuff yeah go ahead dear yeah it also like has to do with the amount of mindfulness that Sarah has and she's just it it's like she has spent hours thinking something through yet she comes up with it like that and this like amount of like realization like it was interesting how I had to like incorporate this like when I was performing I just like had had to like really envision like this idea or or something and I just had to remember like who I was like who what I came here for and what the purpose was and you know, she had, she had this teacher, the teacher mistreated her and, you know, what it, what would be the most Sarah Crew thing to do? Yeah, like, what, yeah, yeah. like you have to, instead of doing what's like written in, you have to make the decisions yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's like how I was kind of able to pinpoint those specific decisions. Yeah, there is, there is a sense of, yeah, what, what would Sarah Crew do? And uh, Sarah herself uses the device of what would a what would a proper uh, moral princess do? Yeah. You know, 
and pardoning is a you know a real thing. Presidents still still do it, you know, pardon uh, people who they think were wrongfully imprisoned or think they they've served their time and enough's enough. So that still happens, you know. Any anybody else coming down to the wire here? I think so. Any any, uh, you know, Maddie. This is going off. Uh, Kaylee said this much earlier about how yeah. Sarah, when she changes, becomes just more of her better characteristics. And I think that's also the same for how she changes other people. I don't really think anyone does a complete 180 with their character where at the beginning they're this way and they're a complete opposite at the end. I think she finds the positive traits within them and then encourages them to then work on those positive traits and become more confident in themselves and who she knows deep down that they really are. And I think that's a great, a great message for the kids that we also have watching the show that you don't have to change to be a better person, just find the positivity within yourself and then strengthen that. Mm, mm, absolutely. I forgot to mention too, that the, that the, at the, the attic at the end, when you see mm. the, the, the change, her, the effect that she's had on all the girls and how they've changed yeah. and together closely. Uh, I forgot to mention too, too, that, uh, Boldeo by then had snuck in and and decorated the room so now it looked all pretty and nice and mm -hmm. so even the attic itself physically changes because of her you know so all, yeah. the, all those details help hammer that that theme home do we think yeah. um okay. yeah go ahead Rocco uh, do we think Boldeo like secretly knows that the mysterious girl in the attic is Mr. Cruz's <laughs> mother do you think we know that yeah probably yeah, 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 probably. Because it is kind of a weird thing, uh, you know, when I was writing it, that they're right next door. It's like, well, why would he... Yeah, does does he go there because he knows? Um, but then he says, uh, I just thought I'd start... I'll take him anywhere, but I figured why not start right next door? But yeah, I wouldn't blame you, Rocco, for, for kind of put, putting that in the back of your mind as your character, that you prob you have this feeling that that it might be her. Why is she up in the attic and all that? Well, speaking of the attic, guys, we did this with, with Mowgli's room a little bit, just real quick. What, what's in the attic and what does that say? Go ahead. Uh, there's the, uh, like the frame that you, like people use for like making dresses. Yeah, just yeah. The, the wired torso. What is that actually called? A dress, a dress form. form, right? Yeah, uh, <laughs> there's a couple, uh, uh, boxes, and then there's like the crooked picture frames and fireplace. Um, yeah, so let me just say the dress form. Like if you watch The Simpsons or whatever, anything that's like in an attic, there are any fiction where they show an attic, a, a dress form is likely to be shown for some reason. But in this play, given that it's like made of wire, and also the fact that Sarah is like an adolescent, and she's not yet a woman, and yet there's this figure of a grown woman behind her yeah there it is there um you know what i mean that almost sounds, that becomes something else it's like it's like something that suggests a, a grown-up woman spirit you know and then you got this little girl in front of it and then and then uh, i love that the dress form just happens to match the birdcage and i mean do i really need to go into what's the birdcage She's trapped. <laughs> yeah, she's, I mean, in, in, in literature and uh, in general, birds and being in a cage is just everywhere. If you think about like Johanna in Sweeney Todd, she sings mm. a song to a bird saying, how can you uh, sing while you're in a cage? Meanwhile, she's locked in her room and she's literally singing. So it's kind of ironic. Even think to um, in Aladdin, the Disney cartoon, that whole first scene with Jasmine and the Sultan, uh, she says that she feels trapped. And while she says it, she's taking a bird out of a cage. And then literally as the father saying, uh, you know, I, I don't, I want you to stay here and be protected and cared for. He, as he's saying that he's take, he takes the bird from her and he puts, puts it in the, in the cage, you know? So that kind of stuff is everywhere. And um, again, I just like pointing out fun little, concretes like that you know that you got to make a decision about what's on the set and if it can kind of suggest something thematically while you're doing it uh, then that's great because the, there could have been anything in the attic but I think those two things say a lot and I'll just say just the crooked picture frames 
are absolutely something you'd see in an attic hanging up. But the fact that they're something that is nor supposed to be straight is all crooked mm -hmm. behind her uh, suggests that her world is now right. kind of screwy, you know? I remember in um, the movie Gremlins, the first time that the Gremlins start popping out of Gizmo's back, the movie for the first time does a uh, a, a crooked angle, yeah. as if to say like, things are going cockeyed now, you know? Mm -hmm. And you might not quite notice that, but your brain does, you know? Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, Rocco. Uh, I think I'd like to talk about the, the one blooper that I, that I sure. had. For, for one show. So in the beginning of act two, Boldeo comes out and he's shaving his beard. And that's supposed <laughs> to represent like the time travel of him now being uh, a, a younger man with, without his beard. And- um, he Met Sarah, he, yeah. Sorry, sorry, what was that? To illustrate when, when he met Sarah, he was a younger man, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And um, I'm supposed to wait for this light cue before I start speaking, but this one particular day, I must have been like turned too far or I thought the light cue was something else. And then I just shaved for a whole minute. <laughs> it was like soft music playing and I'm just passionately just, just, just going for it. I'm like waiting for the light cue and it just doesn't happen. And then I'm like, oh, there you were. I did not see you there. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, act two, I, I always favored uh, because I had this really, I had this, this really great outfit. And because I didn't have the beard restricting my face, I was free. I was really able to embody like young bull day. I was jumping around a lot more. Uh, <laughs> it, was a lot, it was a lot more comfortable. It was, it was great. It was good, good for the character. It all worked out. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that, Rocco. And I remember going like, what's, what's he doing? What's he waiting for? <laughs> There's nothing to do, you know? Uh, <laughs> but remember, I remember you got, when you finally did the turn and go, oh, uh, you got a big laugh. From the oh audience. yeah, yeah. There was a. I was <laughs> <laughs> so it ended up working fine. Yeah. So Carly, I see you there. Are you? Uh... Well, Rocco actually read my mind. I was going to ask yeah. if there were any other bloopers that you know you know happened, um, maybe the audience didn't know happened. And then that'll be our final thoughts for today. There's one in this recording. Yes, there is. Go ahead, dear. <laughs> <laughs> there was supposed to be a little soap dish on the fireplace that they put the flowers in, but there wasn't one there. And this had happened like in during rehearsals too, where the soap, soap disc wasn't out. So I was like thinking, I was like, oh no, we don't have a soap disc. So I just was like, I have a hat. So I was like, here, miss, we can use this. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, miss, we can use this. <laughs> yeah, and, um, good for you, Molly, for doing that. So just, it works like, beautifully. You would like, never know I'm that. I'm very proud of myself mistake. that day. Same here. That's awesome. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh. Go ahead, Molly, uh, yeah, Damon Rush. Yeah. So I remember Maddie and I were the maids at the beginning of the show <laughs> and that whole scene, we had to move like the entire set. The whole set. Like Jake and others and it, several shows, not just, it was like a couple different shows. Things would just fall down. Like there were those horns that were on like the, the privacy, like the partition thing that I had to fold up that would like fall off sometimes or there was something on the piano that would fall off and yeah. you'd have to just like grab it and try and get off stage again yeah, there were a couple of shows where we just could not get the coat on sarah like we just it really wasn't working <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of moving pieces there with that yeah with that set i mean it, we were left over with a nice set from Breaking up is hard to do. It looked a little yeah. different. There was lattice work all over it. It looked like dirty dancing, like a Catskills mm -hmm. yeah. Kind of ugly, but so we decided to make it look like an old timey theater with the dark blue and the, the gold, you know, wallpaper and the mm -hmm. red curtain and stuff. Um, but other than that set, I mean, there really isn't anything else. The set is made up of mm. pieces. It's just different pieces put together, you know, which I like. I mean, if, with set, if I ever like publish this, you know, you could pitch it as, hey, you don't need a whole full-on set. You just need parts and pieces and yeah. you can put it together. But yeah, the moving scene was, was a little difficult. I remember the piano had a couple things on it. And once once you guys moved it off stage and I shared this loud crash, <laughs> and I still have the elephant, you know, the Indian looking elephant that was on top of that. And I think it's missing a, a leg and part of it. <laughs> I remember like cheering for you guys during that part backstage because I was I like, like fighting for my entrance and I was like, they did it! 
<laughs> and then right after that, Molly and I had to run downstairs and change things to Ermengarde and Lavinia. Yeah. So we just moved the set and then we would bolt downstairs, change really quick, and then bolt back up. And it's an impressive change though. I really like all the people really doing cool stuff change. and by the end of the scene, it's all gone. You know, and mm -hmm. you get the sense That's that they're moving. Really cool. and, uh, yeah, go ahead, dear. Molly, uh, or go to uh, Olivia, go ahead. All right. All right. So I, um, so I remember in the beginning of act two, I would have to clean. And so I think one time I went on like kind of really early. So I was just cleaning like intermission. I was just cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> I was just cleaning. I, I don't, it was like a really long time. It was like, <laughs> when you go out uh, in the street too and give the girl, get the coin and stuff too, you're supposed to, in this recording, you're typically you had a basket and a shopping list and something else and it must have just not been set there for you. <clears throat> so you do like you kind of hold up your skirt or whatever. So you cover for it well. <laughs> and I remember um, during rehearsals one time, um, do you remember when I busted the light? <laughs> I felt so bad about it. No, the what, which light? There, you know how around the stage there was like all these oh, lights? Oh yeah. And yeah. Um, I like stood up and like I broke one and I felt so bad about it. I definitely broke one of those too. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I replaced a couple of those. Well, as much as I love hearing about all of these bloopers on stage, unfortunately yeah. we have to cut this a little short. Uh, Stephen, do you want to talk about what we're going to be seeing for next week? So coming this week, we'll be you can uh, watch anytime, stream anytime. Uh, Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp, our version of Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp, which uh, is uh, uh, somewhat tied to Jungle Book and a little princess with the with the character of uh, Boldeo, and it kind of wraps up his time with us <laughs> and uh, gives him a proper a proper send off and a proper three-part you know kind of uh, trilogy and the deal with that and we can get into it when we talk about aladdin is um that i just threw in as a gag in the beginning of a little princess him holding up objects from other stories so the dagger the dagger from uh jungle book and then the treasure map from treasure island right cool. and then um uh and then uh I got like a, a a lamp, something that looks like Aladdin's lamp, and he holds that up. And he goes, "Nope, not that either." And from there, I think we joked about the idea of of what if he was involved in that story. And then I started mm -hmm. thinking, well, if he was, he would definitely be the genie, and maybe not know it. So it opened up a whole a whole story idea and a and a good way to to wrap up his his time and give him some redemption and uh, and send him off properly. Because now you had two stories with him. It seemed proper that you need a you need a return of a Je the Jedi, you know, to wrap it all up. Yeah, uh, and now yeah. and and then and then uh, you know, we're gonna have the prequels and then the one. <laughs> right. more. <laughs> well, part of sending them off too is for myself as a writer too to say, all right, I gotta get rid of this crutch of, uh, <laughs> you know, always returning to the same narrator. Um, but Aladdin is quite different from the other two. Um, but we'll get into that next week. Yeah, cool. I can't wait to see that. So again, I apologize for the technical difficulties of not being able to stream this live on YouTube, but hopefully you all have a chance to watch us on our website and you will be able to see Aladdin next Sunday, hopefully on YouTube. <laughs> and you'll be able to participate live with any questions and comments you have, but any feedback you may have about today's talkback, you can still email over to info at majestictheater.com. So thank you everyone for joining us today and until next time. Thank you, everybody. Until next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.